Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second session of the Smoke on Go Virtual School Series. Today, we uh, deal with the instrument rating. You will remember that in lesson number one, we talked about instrument flying, not the rating, just the flying as a precursor to starting up uh, the, the, the training for the night rating. It was so very important to be able to fly on instruments before starting with the night flying because of the always running the risk of uh, losing uh, your orientation or uh, succumbing to vertigo and ending up in a spiral dive at night where you don't have much background lighting. So we start then uh, and we just recap on what we dealt with last time. Last time we said that when it came to instrument flying, we needed to know how to fly the aeroplane by sole reference to the flight instruments only in straight and level flight maintaining your height, maintaining your heading, climbing, descending, turning, climbing turns, descending turns, and recoveries from awkward attitudes. That was enough to get you to fly the aeroplane safely at night when there was no horizon. We now move on to the instrument rating, and we have to up the ante as far as instrument flying is concerned. Now, just to recap, the ultimate instrument uh, flying trainer uh, for me was the Harvard. And I mentioned that the flying instructor who normally sat in the back and the student sat in the front, for instrument flying, this was changed around. The flying instructor sat in the front seat and the uh, student was cocooned in the back seat. He or she had a canvas hood that closed in the cockpit and you could not see a single thing outside of the cockpit. Nothing was visible besides the instruments and uh, the engine controls and certain of the levers. Uh, in the civilian world, uh, people wear one of these hoods, and it's an important. You are just kidding yourself if you can see uh, outside of, uh, of what this hood allows you or should allow you to see. In other words, if you can catch a glimpse of the horizon, you are defeating the object. You have to have uh, some sort of hood that enables you to see only the flight instruments and certain of the engine controls. So we go over the same exercises again, except as I said that we up the ante. So when it comes 
to straighten level flying, you are now expected to be able to fly the aeroplane at a given airspeed to sort out the power so that you end up flying at a very definite airspeed because this is going to become important. Also, you need to be able to accelerate the aeroplane and to cope with the trim changes. As you accelerate, the angle of attack must be reduced. As you decelerate, so the angle of attack of the aeroplane must be increased. And you need to be able to do that exercise, accelerate or decelerate without losing height. A step further is to be able to either extend or retract the flaps or both. You should be able to extend the flaps, cope with the trim change, cope with the increase in drag and fly the aeroplane accurately and then reduce speed, retract the flaps and when you retract the flaps then immediately there is going to be a trim change as well, there's going to be less drag and the aeroplane is going to accelerate. So we start off with being able to accelerate, decelerate, change the configuration of the aeroplane. We do descents, but when you descent, you are expected to be able to descend at a speed and at a very definite rate of descent. Changing to the climb, you've got to be able to climb the aeroplane at a speed and if power permits to achieve a certain climb rate. Then taking the descending and climbing turns one step further, you need to be able to turn onto a heading and lose a certain amount of height simultaneously or climb to a certain height and turn onto a certain heading uh, at the same time. So all in all, um, the, 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 the second phase of your instrument flying training is a lot more demanding and you have to end up being able to fly this aeroplane as neatly and as accurately as you would if you had clear weather and a clear horizon. So once absolute efficiency has been achieved in flying these exercises, it's time to move on to the simulator because what you are now going to do is learn about the procedures associated with uh, the instrument rating. Now simulators come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Right at the top of the spectrum, you will get the simulators that you find in the airlines. And they will build simulators for all sorts of these airliners. For the 747, the 787, the 747-400 series, the A350s, the A340s, the A320s, the 737s, 200, 300, 400. 500, 600, 700, 800, and the max. And these simulators replicate the aeroplane almost 1,000% of the way there. The only thing that is missing is that you are still attached to the ground and, uh, and that, uh, that you aren't actually really in the air with these simulators. They have visuals, visual systems that are computer generated and they also uh, have motion systems. They have what they call six axis motion. So where do you get six axes from? Remember that the aeroplane can roll around the longitudinal axis. That is one axis. It can pitch around the lateral axis. That is Two, it can yaw around the vertical axis, that's three. But the aeroplane can also move, the, the simulator can move this way or that way, all right? It can move this way or that way, and it can accelerate and decelerate. And all of these movements affect the fluid in the inner ear, and the follicles, the movement of the follicles, and they actually, in between the doctors and the engineers and the scientists, they're able to introduce movements of the simulator 
that are interpreted by the brain as pitching, rolling, yawing, etc., etc., etc. It feels as if you are actually in the real aeroplane, but you're not. What is the advantage of the simulator? It is safe to operate. Nobody ever spun into the ground and crashed in a simulator or lost control of the aeroplane and crashed and was killed in a simulator. Absolutely impossible. All right. It, uh, any accident that you have, boom, the simulator stops, it times out, and nobody can get hurt. It is safe to operate. They are inexpensive to operate compared to aeroplanes. They cost a lot of money to buy, but they are inexpensive to operate. You can operate them 24 hours a day without the people in the neighboring uh, suburbs complaining about the noise of an aeroplane going round and round. You can operate them in any weather, day, night, raining, snowing, blowing, whatever, and then you can actually uh, uh, select on the, uh, the, the, the visual systems the uh, environmental conditions that you want. Do you want rain? Do you want snow? Do you want blowing dust? Do you want to operate at dawn or at dusk? Whatever it is, you can do with the simulator. That is a top-of-the-range simulator. But where you are starting off, you're going to your flight school. Your flight school is going to have a nifty little simulator. Believe you me, it's amazing what they've achieved. They might not have the motion systems and, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, visual systems that the big airliners have, but they really do a good job of building these simulators, and they are quick change. They can go from uh, an advanced single-engined aeroplane to a twin-engined aeroplane to uh, a, an executive jet or whatever, merely by changing the software. But we'll get into this at a later stage, and if I don't happen to discuss this, you are certainly going to come across these simulators somewhere between your 100 and 200 hours when you are working towards the instrument rating. So the other thing about this simulator is that at the end of a session, the whole thing is recorded and you can actually take snapshots of where things went wrong. What do I mean by snapshots? You can take a snapshot of what situation the aeroplane was in, in terms of speed and in terms of height, or you can actually uh, get a paper print out of where the aeroplane was tracking. If you happen to get lost in a, uh, a complex procedure, and you lost situational awareness and spatial awareness. Where were you? Which way were you going? Were you climbing? Were you descending? Whatever. You can get a paper printout, and there you can actually have the errors of your way uh, being explained to you, or you can... Uh, utilize this as a training aid to say, hey, look, this is why you went wrong or where you went wrong, and uh, this is how to avoid it in the future. All right. So simulators are going to play more and more of a part in your training, particularly in the training towards the, uh, the instrument rating. Let's recap over here very quickly. We know what the advantages of the simulator are. We know that the aspirant instrument rated pilot has been trained to fly this aeroplane absolutely perfectly. And then that person has moved to the simulator because here we're able to look at the procedural training all the aspects regarding the procedures that are associated with the instrument rating. So, 
we start off by learning the concept of intercepting headings inbound towards a facility or outbound from a facility by means of the automatic direction finder that is tuned to a non-directional beacon, an NDB, and you use your ADF, and then you learn how to intercept headings towards the uh, radio facility and away from it. The uh, most basic radio navigation aid that exists is the one that we've just talked about now. That is the non-directional beacon which provides information to the automatic direction finding device. But as we progress, we learn more about the VOR, the Very High Frequency Omni Range Radio. And that basically is a device that can be likened to a bicycle wheel that is lying flat horizontally. And if that bicycle wheel, if you can imagine the bicycle wheel from where the axle is having 360 spokes, extending from the axis to the perimeter in one degree increments. Now turn the bicycle wheel so that it is vertical and the spoke that goes vertically upwards is the 360 or 00, zero spoke. 90 degrees clockwise is the 90 degree spoke and then Vertically downwards, that's the 180 degree spoke, and then continuing in a clockwise direction until you have gone another 90 degrees, that's 270 degrees, okay? Coming back to 360 degrees. Each and every one of those spokes has a number attached to it um, in one degree increments. Now, what will happen is that you can utilize this radio system to fly out on a chosen spoke. If from, the, from your airport to your uncle's farm is on the 019er spoke, you can select that and you can fly that spoke to your uncle's farm. All right, that is what the VOR is all about. So what your instructors do is they give you a far better lesson than I can give you right now, standing here without any aids. But you will learn how to uh, fly a radial outbound. You will learn how to fly a radial inbound. These two steps that you have taken forward enable you to fly the very very first lead downs the basic lead downs we have ndb lead downs and we have vor lead downs the ndb lead down is something that is virtually disappeared and, uh, and and if it hasn't yet already it's on its way out but NDBs are still to be found for certain farmers that are aviation orientated and that have utilized their aeroplanes for their farming activities uh, have often invested in an NDB and placed it on the farm. If it's not on a farm, it might be on a factory, at a power station, at a mine, or wherever. Wherever there's a fair amount of air traffic and people need to get in and out uh, of, of that place in, in bad weather, uh, they might in fact have invested in an NDB. VORs... VORs are to be found in virtually every single very large town slash small city in South Africa. You've got them in, uh, in and around Johannesburg. There's one at Heidelberg. There's one at Grasmere. There's one at Hardebeersport Dam. There's one at uh, O.R. Tambo itself. There's one at Lanseria Airport. And then going further afield, the next one that you might encounter could be uh, as far away as Kimberley or Bloemfontein. Uh, 
and then uh, the, the, all, all the other major towns and cities, they have the VORs. You're able to let down using an NDB or a VOR, but the type of let down that you do is called a non-precision approach. Non-precision approach. What do we mean by non-precision approaches? Non-precision approaches give you directions and they give you guidance in azimuth. In other words, you're able to line up with a runway, you're able to approach the runway at a certain angle, you're able to control uh, your, your, your flight path so that it, it, it lines up with the, with the runway. What it does not do is it does not give you any vertical guidance. So you aren't able to fly a flight path. There is no flight path guidance. What you have to do is at a certain point in the approach, you have to descend fairly rapidly, level off, hold that height, continue to another point in the approach, and then descend again and level off. There is no precision associated with that, so it is called a non-precision approach. The be-all and end-all of letdowns is the ILS, the Instrument Landing System. That enables you to fly a precision approach. And a precision approach means that not only do you have lateral guidance, you also have vertical guidance. You're able to fly a very, very accurate a flight path down to the touchdown. You will be able to, to, to fly the ILS approaches in your simulator. But what you have to understand is that ILSs in this country are few and far between. Uh, I don't think we've got more than about 10 ILSs in the whole country. You start with Cape Town, you've got George, you've got Port Elizabeth, East London, Durban, Nelspruit, back here to Johannesburg and Lanseria, and that's about it. It's very, very difficult to find a place where you can do ILS training. Notwithstanding that, there's also the problem that the airplanes that you're flying with in the flight school, the actual airplanes, might not have ILS uh, uh, systems fitted to them. So, uh, so the thing is that you, like it or not, the very best way of obtaining your training is through the simulator, and this is what you are going to do. You're going to learn how to fly the ILS in the simulator. So we have now come back. We, we understand the pros and cons of the simulator. We understand that you're going to learn how to do non-precision approaches, two types. The one is with an NDB and the other with a VOR, and that you will graduate to uh, ILSs, but you might not then fly another ILS for a long, long time, until such time that you actually join a company and fly to places where uh, ILS approaches are commonplace, where you might end up flying four or five ILSs in every single day that you fly. The one approach that we haven't got to yet, and we're not going to discuss it much either, and that is RNAV GNSS. That is the way of the future. RNAV GNSS approaches uh, are coming into their own now, but you need very sophisticated systems in the aeroplane. You need a flight management system. You need a, a way of presenting the navigation um, data that is on display. So uh, uh, it, it, it is in the future, and uh, I predict that uh, not many years from now, 
the only way of, be, of doing a, a, a lid down will be by means of RNAV and GNSS. Slowly but surely, uh, the, the other systems or the other methods are, 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 are just going to uh, pale into insignificance. Right. So we get on to the subject of uh, the, the, the type of control that you are likely to encounter once you uh, have got your instrument rating. The first is that control could be procedural. What do we mean by procedural? We mean by procedural that there is no radar. The controller cannot see you. He doesn't know where you are exactly. He has to rely on position reports from the pilot of the aeroplane to say where the aeroplane is, which direction it's going, or where it is in the sequence of events in order to control the aeroplane any further. That is called procedural control. The other type of control is called radar control. That is where the controller can see you. He can sequence the aeroplanes with, uh, with uh, the, the required spacing in between them. He can look at the height of the aeroplanes. He can climb them and descend them so that the collision is avoided. And the, the, uh, the air traffic control can be done by means of radar. So there's procedural control and there is radar control. Procedural control is your worst nightmare, but that is the way you are going to be trained initially. Because there is, wherever you go to fly VOR lead downs and, uh, and NDB lead downs, it is a 90% certainty that there's going to be no radar available. You're going to be doing things in the old fashioned way. I said, by means of position reports as you sequence your way through procedure. So let me give you a real life uh, situation over here. There was a time where in Angola, the airline over there had to rely heavily on South African Airways to, to do their services because they had been banned from flying into Europe. So the 747 fleet, which was dormant, lying dormant at SAA, was reactivated and uh, four or five aeroplanes were put to use helping the Angolans out. Uh, I happened to be flying that type of aeroplane at that point in time, and I was one of the guys that was going up and down between Johannesburg, Luanda, and Europe. Uh, uh, over and over and over again. And um, uh, one night I flew off to Luanda and uh, there was another South African Airways aeroplane coming in from Europe. Two of us were going to arrive at uh, uh, Luanda at the same time, but never mind that, there were another four aeroplanes that were arriving there at the same time. Six aeroplanes altogether, no radar. So this is where procedural control came. Uh, this is where I saw it at its very best slash very worst. All right, it was the most challenging, but it all worked out well in the end. There were five aeroplanes that were all sent to the NDB at, uh, at Luanda, and uh, there we went into a holding pattern. Luanda is at sea level. We had an aeroplane at, the first aeroplane was at 2,000 feet AGL, 3,000 foot, 4,000 foot, 5,000 foot, 6,000 feet. Five aeroplanes separated each by 1,000 feet. And the idea was that as the lowest one was released onto the final approach and then descended, and as I said, non-precision, it was a sort of duck and level off and hope 
that you would see the runway. That is what happened there. One airplane would commence the approach and land, uh, and then the next aeroplane would be cleared for the approach. Everybody would shuttle down a thousand feet. Anybody else joining would join above the aeroplane that was at 6,000 feet that had now gone to 5,000. The next one to join would be at 6,000 and the next one at 7,000 feet. And slowly but surely, everybody would work their way down and until it was your turn as number one to go in and land. At that point in time, would you just believe it? They had a power failure. Boom. And that was it. Uh, the, the, the flare path went. The, uh, uh, the approach lights went. Even the air traffic controller was silent over there because they'd lost everything. Radios, lighting, and all the aids. Nothing left. So... What happened was that this was procedural control at its very, very best. We took over. And it just happened that the most experienced guys were the two South African Airways aeroplanes. I was in one of them, and I had uh, two pilots over there that were really bright guys, and the same existed in the other aeroplane, and we worked it out and handled this whole thing procedurally because eventually we had just enough light on the runways to effect the approach and land safely. If we had had radar control, then the radar control would have started a long time earlier. They would have, they not only would we have been separated longitudinally, laterally, or vertically, right, but we might have been uh, vectored for extra track miles to get into a line, to get into a line so that they could land one aeroplane after another. That is first prize, radar control. You have to listen very carefully to an air traffic controller to hear exactly what procedure or what type of uh, service that controller is, is uh, offering at, the, at that point in time. For example, they might say you are radar identified. If they say that you are radar identified, that, that means that they can see you. Nothing more. Nothing more. We can see you. We know who you are. We've attached a label to that blip on the screen to say that that is your aeroplane. You're radar identified. From radar identification, you get to radar control. Now you can expect to be separated from other aeroplanes laterally, longitudinally, vertically. All right. That is to be under radar control control. When you are under radar control, you as the pilot remain responsible for terrain clearance until the next magic words are heard, and that is radar vectors. When the, when the air traffic controller says, I am radar vectoring you, then you know that you are going to be kept clear of uh, other aircraft and of terrain. That is a long, long way away for all of you at this point in time. Even in the run up to your uh, instrument rating, the chances are that you are not ever going to enter controlled airspace and be part of these air traffic control systems. Simply because, A, you don't have the equipment, B, your airplanes are mismatched speed-wise with the airliners that are scooting around in controlled airspace. But you're going to learn about it in the simulator. And it's important that you grasp the basics. And that's what I've been going through with you now. The world depends on aerospace. And aerospace depends on us to engineer the propulsion flight demands.
to lift and connect us to new possibilities and to bring us home. To be ready to powerfully defend our values and to help keep us safe. To enable us to prosper and thrive and enjoy more amazing days. To build and grow relationships, for help in urgent moments, and hope wherever it's needed most. And aerospace depends on us for powerful, sustainable propulsion, reliably there, everywhere lifting us into the future and up toward the stars. We are Pratt & Whitney, powering aviation. Depend on it. We've talked about the types of control that you are going to be exposed to. And for the next couple of hundred hours, the best you will encounter will be procedural control, where the air traffic controller is saying, call me over the beacon, call me turning outbound, call me turning inbound, call me passing overhead the beacon again on the way uh, in for the landing, etc., etc. That is the procedural control. And that's the best that you are going to come across. Except in the simulator, there you can actually uh, experience what you will experience in real life at a later stage when you have more experience and you are flying more advanced aeroplanes. So what I want to do now is I want to come back to the various types of ILS approaches. I have said to you that ILS is the be all and end all at this point in time to a certain extent being overtaken by RNAV GNSS approaches, which have a whole string of advantages on their own. But, uh, but, but this is beyond the scope of the lesson today. So we look at these uh, ILS approaches. I go down this road also so that when you are in the company of more experienced pilots or you happen to have friends that are already joining the airlines or flying, uh, 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 or flying exec aeroplanes, when they start talking this language of instrument lead nouns, at least you don't sit there with a mouthful of teeth. You're able to understand what they're talking about and to absorb and to listen. So. When we talk about these ILSs, they come in terms of categories. The ILS category one approach is an ILS approach that enables you to fly the localizer, left and right, the glide slope up and down, down to a minimum down to a minimum of 200 feet. If you have not seen the runway at 200 feet, you're obliged to go around and overshoot. All right, you do a go-around procedure, and you go and you give it another try or you divert. And the visibility that is allowed is 550 meters. You can't start that approach if the visibility is below 550 meters. So a category one ILS, as I said, allows you down to 200 feet and, it, and, 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 and you should have a minimum of 550 meters uh, of visibility. As the aeroplanes become more complex 
and you are subjected to further training, you're able to fly an ILS approach down to what we call Category 2 minima. A Category 2 minima means that you can fly down to a decision height of 100 foot and a runway visual range. We don't talk about visibility any longer because visib visibility is in all directions. A runway visual range is down the runway measured by, by a, a gadget called a transmissometer. And that will allow you down to uh, a 100 foot and 300 meters runway visual range. But you need certain other equipment to be able to do a category two approach. You have to have two autopilots and both autopilots have to be engaged in order for you to fly that category two. You do not necessarily have to have auto landing capability because you can disengage the autopilot the moment you've got the desired visual reference and you can go ahead and land. From category two, you progress to category three. When you get to category three, then you can go down to a decision height of 50 feet and a runway visual range, I think, of the order of about 150 meters. So you can get in where the weather is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And that is called a Cat 3A approach. Cat 3A. 50 feet decision height, 150 meters runway visual range. You have to have two autopilots working at that stage of the game, and it is desirable to do an automatic landing. Uh, it is only in uh, certain circumstances that you are actually allowed to go ahead and disengage the autopilot and still land, because it doesn't give you much time in which to adapt when you are disengaging an autopilot at 50 feet. We move to Cat 3B. And CAT 3B is a zero decision height. You don't even have to see the ground uh, before the time. And the, the, uh, the runway visual range is down to about 100 meters. So imagine that. Imagine 100 meters is just a, 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 a rugby field. That's all it is, 100 meters. A rugby field and you're sitting there in a 747 or an A350 or an A340 or a 787 and here you are landing and the only amount of vis that you've got is the length of a rugby field. And there you are heavily dependent on the, the, the lighting systems we talked about in lesson one. We talked about the runway center line lights. We talked about the runway edge lights. We talked about the uh, decelerating, the lights that you used when you were decelerating towards the end of the run. And then the runway stop bar lights. What we never mentioned was the mat that you land on. You land on a mat of lights, three rows for a thousand feet, three rows uh, uh, to the left of the runway center line and another three rows to the right. And they give you a, a, an illuminated mat to land on. They will also tell you when you're in a long flare situation. If you see those lights disappear underneath you, all right, then you are beginning to run out of runway and you've got to go around. So the approaches get more and more and more complex. But this is a long way in the future. It is nevertheless a fascinating subject. In order to do one of these landings, Cat 3B, where you've got a zero foot decision height, you need three autopilots. And all three of those autopilots are talking to each other. Even when you've got two, they're talking to each other. Uh, and when I say they're talking to each other, what I'm saying there is that they are comparing the signals, the signal strength, the, 
the, the deviations that are being recorded, etc., etc., a comparison is being made between all the data that those autopilots are receiving and which has been trans transmitted to the autopilot by the, the radio receivers. So the radio receivers are getting this information, a comparison is being made, the, the info is being sent to the autopilots, a comparison is being made, and everything is well and good. There you go, and you do what is called a fail operational landing. Fail operational, what does it mean? Nothing can go wrong. Go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, but nothing can go wrong. Okay, fail operational, three of these systems Bearing notes all of the time, and there you are landing in a hundred meters, round about 140 knots, and you've got a hundred meters that you can see. That's it. Okay. So that's what lies ahead and makes things very, very exciting for the future. Now I want to just go back to the question and answer session that we had after lesson one. Uh, you have to understand that I'm having to think on my feet without much time to think about the proper answer, and sometimes I never gave answers that the, the people that questioned deserved. All right. So I want to go back to three of the questions that were asked the other night. There was talk about the use of the parpies. And when we fly these approaches, you gather that there is very, very little time in which you become visual. When the weather is down to minimums, between the time that you, that you become visual, that you have the desired uh, visual references, and you touch down very, very little time, that uh, parpy is in view for seconds only, seconds only. But when the weather is okay, maybe a little bit marginal, when you're flying visually, you have to be so very careful of becoming disorientated on the final approach. Because with your landing lights on, and a crosswind and driving rain, etc., etc. You actually can suffer from vertigo. There's also the refraction of light. You might lose the glide slope. You might push forward on the stick prematurely and get a little bit low in the approach. So the parpy is there to ensure that if you are flying visually, when you are flying visually, that at all times you are on the correct slope. And the parpy caters for the light jets, the medium jets, and the heavies, and what they call the supers now, like the A380 is a super. It caters for those aeroplanes, and it ensures that the aeroplanes have got the guidance to be able to stay on the desired, say, three degree glide slope. Now, what I never had the time to actually explain in detail, what happens is that when you have a swept wing jet, that aspect ratio, the aspect ratio is reducing, the, the ratio of width to length, that is reducing. A low aspect ratio aeroplanes approach with and nose high attitudes. All of these jets, the, everything you see coming in to land here at OR Tambo and at Cape Town, etc., 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 they are approaching the ILS with a nose up there at about three degrees. That's what they're doing. They're also flying a three degree slope because that is the universally accepted angle for the ILS. It used to be 2.7. Here and there in the world, 
there might be an ILS that is still set up with a 2.7 degree slope. 98% of them are 3 degree slopes and then where there is a little bit of terrain like Cape Town Runway 19 with, uh, with, the, with, with the mountain that is sitting on, off on your left hand side, it happens to be a 3.3 degree slope. But the point is that there the aeroplane is with a 3 degree nose up on a 3 degree glide slope. Right. Now, the pilot is looking out of the window. I told you that he, we, we're flying in visual conditions over here. He's looking out, he or she, looking out of the window, and there is a, a point that they are aiming for. They're aiming for about a thousand feet in of the runway threshold. So here we are, let's take this as the runway threshold, let's take this as the runway length, and they are aiming at a point which is, say, exactly a beam of that point there. That's where the eye is going. The eye is going, and, and if, if this was made of cam candy floss and the aeroplane could, could actually descend through, through the ground over here, all right, through this plane, then with the eyeball aiming there and the aeroplane flying down like that, the eye is aiming there. But look at where the rear wheels sit in any big jet airliner. They don't sit up front like they do with this aeroplane and like they do with that aeroplane and Dakotas and DC-4s and, uh, and, and Barons and uh, um, Beach 1900s, etc., etc. So what is happening is with the airliners, the main wheels are sitting back here. Right back here, something like on the 727, 64 feet behind you. And in the Airbus A340-600, which is a long, thin, slender aeroplane, those wheels might be there a uh, uh, hundred feet behind the pilot's eye. So have a look at this, and here we're going to the land of candy floss. So we're going to go through the, through the earth over here, through this plane. All right. Or like a cloud bank or whatever. And in you come and you're aiming, your eyeball is aiming for that point like this. See that? What's happening to these wheels? Where are they hitting? Look at that. Look at that distance. The wheels are hitting short. How short? Well, on the 727, which I, when I was taught this, this was in the year 1975, 76, I remembered this and I remembered the figures, something like 600 feet, 600 feet behind you. So if you were not to flare the aeroplane and you just carried on downwards like that, you're going to hit 600 feet further back. The flatter the approach, the further back you are going to hit the ground. And it also, it could be that if, if you're disorientated because of the cloud and this and that, and you push forward on the stick and then you change, and you have altered your aiming point here, brought it further back, that your wheels are going to hit the ground outside of the perimeter of the airport. That is what they call the classic duck under accident. And this is the reason why we have parpies, and that is to ensure that the swept wing jet is not exposed to the possibility of having its main undercarriage hit the ground before you have got to the runway threshold, in amongst all of the runway lighting, with catastrophic results. So I said the other night that this applies so much to swept wing jets, but not entirely to aeroplanes that have got high aspect ratios with straight wings. Dakotas, Skymasters, DC-6s, DC-7s, uh, Beach 1900s, uh, Embraer uh, 130s, etc., etc.
Now the time has come for us to talk about uh, the state-of-the-art simulators that are available in the training industry. So we're very lucky to have uh, as our special guest Jonathan Duruk, who is the Chief Flying uh, in Instructor at Avcon Jet, based at Grand Central Airport, and uh, good afternoon to you, uh, Jonathan. Good afternoon, Scully. It's uh, very nice to be meeting with you. Thanks for having me today. There comes a point in the training of a pilot where you move over to the simulator, particularly yes. when it comes to learning the procedures associated with uh, flying in uh, controlled airspace and under IFR, Instrument Flying Rules. Okay, so, yes, so the thing is, tell me uh, something about the simulator that you use at uh, Avcon Jet. Well, first of all, Scully, um, the first time that a student will be introduced to simulator flying will be those uh, five hours during the night rating, as you already mentioned earlier on. That would be very basic instrument flying, just uh, giving the students an overall outline of what instrument flying is about. But I think where we're going today um, with, within the discussion is more about the IF training in particular. Um, and that would come during uh, or just after a student's hour building Every student needs to build that 100 hours of PRC, which includes some night flying cross country and whatever. And we like to take a student and put them into the sim and start really um, starting with the instrument fly, flight training at about 85 or 80 to 85 hours of their uh, PRC that they've built up. Um, we have a brand new Simu flight um, simulator installed which uh, has the Piper range, three of the Piper range from the Piper Seneca 3, which is a multi-engine aircraft. Then we have the non-complex Piper Cherokee and also the Piper Arrow, which is the complex single engine aircraft uh, with a variable pitch, uh, retractable undercarriage and so on. And then what is very nice about our simulator is that we also boast the 425, which is the Cessna Course Air or Conquest, which is for turbine training. And that is also a twin, which boasts the PT6 uh, engines. Yes. Okay, so let me just get one thing straight. Yes. Uh, two things straight. Number one, I heard you mention that uh, this simulator was built by Simuflight. That is a, a, that's a local company, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and very renowned, actually. Absolutely, I've heard nothing but good, and uh, yeah. and indeed, I've I've actually I've actually had a little of ex little experience uh, flying one of their simulators, and that was the Jetstream, uh, the uh, yeah. HS one forty one, I think that's what it's called, that uh, SA Airlink had, and they built a terrific simulator for yeah. the for the Jetstream training. So so that is the same company that uh, that that you have just. Uh, acquired this uh, simulator from? Yes, uh, uh, Simuflight pride themselves on trying to get a model as accurately simulated as the real machine. Um, I also provide training on the King Air 200 on the Simuflight machine and I can tell you when the students go for their base check um, there is almost no difference between what they did in the simulator to the real aircraft. The student is comfortable from the first minute within that aircraft. So they replicate the feel of the aeroplane very accurately. Yes, now, they do. If my memory serves me correctly, uh, they are fixed base simulators. They uh, that Simu Flight makes. They uh, yes. they do if not. Uh, they're not mounted on on jacks. They do not move the way that the no. airline ones do. The accuracy on the instruments, the layouts, also the feeling on the controls, simulating that feedback on the controls as well as we don't just have the screens in front of us, we have a full wraparound screen. So when sitting in the aircraft and doing a turn or a roll, it genuinely feels as if as though you are in motion. So without the 
fourth effect of, of movement, um, your, the visuals simulate um, the experience as closely as possible. I happened to notice the same thing. I just couldn't, I couldn't believe my eyes, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, to to see what they had achieved in terms of uh, computer-generated imagery. Now, yes. uh, are you able to to change your visual, so uh, the, your visual presentation, should I say, so that uh, you either have a dawn or a daylight, or an evening, or a nighttime flight, or a flight in rain, snow, or whatever. Are you able to do that? Yes, we are. So along with a very accurately world, uh, world scenery, so we can actually fly to a specific airport or position the aircraft at any airport, we can also simulate all meteorological conditions, including daytime, dawn, dusk. We can actually select the hour of a day during a specific season, and it will simulate that for us. What about the the areas that you operate from? Like, for example, you might you might be, be uh, looking at the standard instrument departures, the standard yes. terminal arrival routes, stars. Mm. Okay, first yep. the SIDs, then the stars, and then the various types of approaches that you do, NDB, VOR, and ILS. But yep. are you able to change with ease from, say, Johannesburg to an operation out of East London, Port Elizabeth, or Cape Town, for example? Yes, well, the wonders of, with the wonders of uh, simulation, usually I would give a student a sortie such as a departure out of Johannesburg for a flight to Cape Town, for instance. And as we all know, between Johannesburg and Cape Town, it's a pretty much of a boring exercise en route. So we would follow the, the instrument uh, departure out of Johannesburg. And once the student has achieved the, um, the, the necessary um, procedure, we would then expedite the aircraft for the uh, arrival route into Cape Town. There are pros with regards to training only in an aircraft. And uh, one of the pros about doing, doing your training in the simulator is that it's cost saving at the end of the day, as we can expedite a flight or a procedure, as I just mentioned, between um, two complete different places. Are you exactly. able to record the flight path of the aeroplane? Are you able to, uh, to, to record the movement of the aeroplane and to have that printed so that in the event that, that the student go, turns the wrong way or applies the wrong procedure, you're able to debrief to a high level? Well, Scully, that's a very good question. We're able to record it in two manners. The first manner is we can record it as the student would see it. So when we play it back, they'll show them the, in, the instrument indications as well as the visual effects. And we can also record it um, from the instructor's point of view, from the instructor's station. So it, uh, from the horizontal and from the vertical, for instance, on a procedure, pro I mean, on an instrument approach, we would be able to show the student where they were flying too high or too low, as well as if they were off of the localizer. Um, we can record that and we have to record it for the CIA's purposes for as a training um, uh, tool, as well as we can use it as a debrief tool for the student. I have one final question. You talked about three of the Piper single-engined aeroplanes and then all of a sudden there was this quantum leap to the Cessna Conquest. Yes. When you change the software from the, the, the behavior of the single-engined aeroplane to the twin-engined aeroplane, what about the actual hardware in the cockpit? I'm talking about instead of one throttle, two throttles. So the whole cockpit is completely configurable. It takes 10 to 15 minutes to change out the whole cockpit. And the panels come off and we snap on the new panels for the new model. It's as easy as that. Okay. The simulator picks up which, which are uh, currently fitted and uh, 
changes its simulation appropriately. Well, it was it was great uh, speaking to Jonathan about state of the art uh, simulation. Uh, we're going to take a short break now, and uh, uh, when we start up again, I will be available to answer any questions that you might have.